Well, the first thing I want to do is I want to tell everybody that I am extremely honored to be here. Make no mistake about it. My friend Chuck Morrow unfortunately couldn't make it today. His grandson is competing in a cheer national championship in Orlando, Florida, and he wanted me to tell everybody that he wished he could be here, but when you're dealing with family, that's very important, and Chuck is, is very upset he couldn't be here today. I always start my talks recognizing my third and my fourth grade teacher, and her name was Mrs. Swain. And every single day, she would talk about a great Virginian, and every single day, I would look forward to her talk. And when we learned about the war between the states, and make no mistake about it, it was the war between the states, we learned about Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Stewart, and Abraham Lincoln in that order. She was a great teacher, she was a great Virginian, Virginian, and she instilled a love of Virginia history in me that's still here today. In tonight's presentation, I'm going to be briefly identifying some of the units, the guerrilla units that operated here in Prince William County, some of the principal figures, and some of the incidents that occurred. Some of them are brutal, and some of them are not. I'm hoping the stories will be of interest to you. I'm going to talk about three guerrilla units that operated here in Prince William County. I'm going to talk about the Prince William Partisan Rangers. They were also called Brawner's Company the Chinkapin Rangers, Company H of the 15th Virginia Cavalry, or Kinchlow's Guerrillas, or Kinchlow's Cavalry. I'm going to talk about Hampton's North South Carolinians, Scouts, or Hampton's Iron Scouts. And I'm also going to talk about John Singleton Mosby and the 43rd Battalion of Virginia <laughs> Cavalry. They were the three primary guerrilla units that operated in Prince William County, and they created havoc to the Union authorities during that two and a half year period, or even more. The first unit I want to talk about is the Prince William Partisan Rangers. The Rangers were made up of men most, mostly from Fairfax and Prince William County. The unit was formed by Captain William Gardner Brawner in May of 1862 in the community of Buck Hall here in Prince William County. They would also be known as Brawner's Cavalry. The Prince William Rangers received its nickname one day when they rode into a village. A woman said, what's the name of your unit? And a guy by the name of James Stone, who was a private in the unit, he said, we're the Chinkapin Rangers. And that name stuck. The Chinkapin Rangers were later incorporated into Company H of the 15th Virginia Cavalry in September of 1862. And except for a brief period in late 1862 and early 1863, the Chinkapin Rangers operated independently as a guerrilla unit here in Northern Virginia and they actually went on raids with Mosby's Rangers. And what's kind of ironic is Mosby got credit for some of the raids that the Chinkapin Rangers conducted. And I want to make sure I say that because they got confused with Mosby's Rangers and the Chinkapin Rangers. In mid-1864, the Chinkapin Rangers were ordered to report back to the 15th Virginia Cavalry, but they refused to do so. And they continued their guerrilla activity in the Northern Virginia. Finally, the Chinkapin Rangers, rather than report back to the 15th Virginia Cavalry, they disbanded their unit rather than go back to the 15th Virginia because 
These men were mostly from Fairfax County and from Prince William County, and they wanted to stay here defending their neighbors and their friends. A lot of the men who would disband from the 15th Virginia Cavalry of Company H would later join Company H of the 43rd Battalion or Mosby's Rangers in early April of 1865. This is a very rare picture that came from the Carper family of Captain William Gardner Brawner. He was a very gallant and brave man. He was born October 17, 1829 in Tudor Hall, Manassas Junction in Prince William County. He attended the University of Virginia and he practiced law in Brentsville in Prince William County. He was selected as a delegate at the state convention to consider the ordinance of secession and he voted to secede. Bronner was commissioned a colonel in the 36th Regiment of Virginia Militia. But there must not have been a whole lot of people in that unit because he would later organize and form the Prince William Partisan Rangers in May of 1862 when he was 32 years old. Bronner also participated in the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862 and also participated in Stewart's Christmas Raid in late December of 62. And he also helped Jeb Stewart in his famous raid at Burke Station. The Chicopin Rangers participated in the very first military engagement conducted by Company A of the 43rd Battalion of Virginia Cavalry at Seneca Mills, Maryland on June 11th of 1863. Captain Brawner was gallantly leading a charge across a bridge chasing this Michigan unit when he was shot and killed at the end of that bridge, ending his service in the Chicopin Rangers. John Ballard of Mosby's command saw the man that shot him and he killed the man that shot Captain Brawner. Brawner's body was recovered by his men a few days later and he would eventually be buried in Alexandria and that's where his body rests today. Another individual I want to talk about is Captain James Cornelius Kinchlow, a man that took over command. He was born April the 25th of 1833. He served as the postmaster of Sangster Station. He voted for secession. He enlisted as a private in the Fairfax Cavalry and it was commanded by Captain Matram Ball. Kinchlow was one of the first Confederates captured on the 24th of May of 1861 when Virginia was invaded by Union troops in Alexandria. Make no mistake about it, they were invaded. I don't know how else to say it. I'm sure there's a lot of history teachers out there that'll want to debate me. Let me know when you want to meet. I rest my case. <laughs> he was appointed the first lieutenant on September the 29th of 1862 at age 29 years old. He also participated in the Battle of Fredericksburg on December 13th of 62, the Christmas raid in late December of 62. And again, he was with Jeb Stewart at Burke Station. James Cornelius Kinchlow commanded the Chicopin Rangers after Brawner's death on June 11th of 1863. And he would remain the commander of the Chicopin Rangers until they disbanded in December of 1864. Kinchlow died. October the 23rd, 
1889 and is buried in the family plot in Clifton, Virginia, in Fairfax County. This is the images of a young Sergeant William Simpson Kinchlow and a picture of what he looked like later in life. I really like to show the images of what they looked like when they were young, and I want to say virile, and when they were old, when I want to say they were wise. <laughs> Sergeant William Simpson, Simpson Kinchlow is the brother of Captain James Cornelius Kinchlow. He was born December 21st, 1837, in Fairfax County. He enlisted in an unknown unit when Virginia seceded from the Union. He wanted to serve his state. A lot of people talk about treason today. I hear it all the time. Virginia had been around for 250 years and our country had only been around for 80 years. Where do you think their allegiance was? I hear this all the time and I get angry. I don't want to be this way. <laughs> he joined Bronner's company on September the 27th of 1862, and two days later, he was promoted to sergeant. Kinchlow was one of the two guides that detailed General Thomas Rosser in his raid at Sanctuar Station in December of 1863. He also participated in a committee established by the Chicopin Rangers to negotiate with Colonel John S. Mosby and the 43rd Battalion of Virginia Cavalry for admittance into a Company H of the 43rd Battalion in the beginning of April of 1865. So he had a lot of say in that unit. He was also involved in a fight when he was a member of Company H of the 43rd Battalion of Virginia Cavalry against the Loudoun Rangers. The Loudoun Rangers was the only Union cavalry unit that was formed in Northern Virginia. And Company H of the 43rd Battalion of Virginia ca casual Cavalry, pardon my speaking, virtually wiped out and annihilated the Loudoun Rangers on April the 6th, 1865, in a place called Keyswitch, near Harper's Ferry in West Virginia. They ceased to exist. Kinchlow captured a horse in that engagement that he rode for many years after the war ended. And I hate to say it, but that horse had a U.S. brand on it. <laughs> William Kinchlow died March 28, 1905, and was buried near his brother, Captain James Cornelius Kinchlow, in the family plot in Clifton. I told you there were several guerrilla units that operated in Northern Virginia. This was Wade Hampton's Iron Scouts. Some people called them Wade Hampton's South Carolinian Scouts. They were a very dangerous unit, and they operated here in Prince William County. Wade Hampton established a 100-man platoon size scout detachment. And many of these scouts, approximately 20 or 30, operated behind enemy lines, especially, especially in Prince William County. And they made a big name for themselves. The Union Army called these men the Iron Scouts. That was a term the Union Army gave them. Because they recovered so quickly after being wounded and seemed free from capture and appeared to be everywhere. These men were considered the most capable troopers of mounted cavalry 
and were considered by Wade Hampton as the bravest of the brave. The Iron Scouts were initially commanded by the middle picture, that is Sergeant William A. Bill Michler. It looks like it's Mickler, but it's pronounced Michler. He was a South Carolinian. He was only 22 or 23 years old. While he commanded the Iron Scouts in 1863 and would later be relieved as the commander of the Iron Scouts after being wounded in Prince William County and being sent back to South Carolina to recuperate from his serious wound. He would never return to Virginia. Michler was a post-war farmer in Florida after the war, and he served in the Florida Senate. He died in St. Augustine, Florida in 1917. Sergeant George D. Shadburn, looks like a pretty big man, looks like a guy I wouldn't want to mess with. He takes over command. He took over command on Christmas Eve of 1863, replacing Michler. He was twice wounded, twice captured, and escaped twice. He was a very amazing and a very brave individual. He was from Texas. He was from Brenham, Texas. And he was proud to be a Texan. After the war, he was a lawyer in San Francisco. And he died in Alameda County, California in 1921. He lived a very long life. The Chicapin Rangers received praise and commendations from the highest levels of the Confederate Army. The raids and escapades conducted by the Iron Scouts would be recognized and praised by Major General Matthew G. Butler, Lieutenant General Wade Hampton, and the Confederate Commanding General Robert E. Lee. Lee recognized the Iron Scouts for gallantry in combat while operating in Prince William County. And I don't know how many people in Prince William County have ever heard about the Iron Scouts. I want to talk briefly about Mosby's Rangers and the 43rd Battalion of Virginia Cavalry. I've been doing the Mosby bus tours myself for the last 22 years. I've been giving talks on Mosby. He's a pretty incredible guy. And we have to talk about that unit and I have to talk about that man. John S. Mosby was born on December 6th of 1833 in Powhatan, right outside of Richmond. He went to the University of Virginia and was expelled for shooting a student, a bully. He was convicted of unlawful shooting and in 1853 was sentenced to a $500 fine and to a year in jail. While he was in jail, the prosecutor who convicted him, a man by the name of William Robertson, saw him reading books, saw that he was a very intelligent fellow, and he started giving him law books while he was in jail. The man who put Mosby in jail ended up being his friend and his mentor. I want you to think about that. On December 6th of 1853, the governor of the state of Virginia 
pardoned Mosby after receiving a petition from the citizens of the state of Virginia. He had served seven months in jail. And he was pardoned by the governor. Mosby went on to become a lawyer in the state of Virginia after passing the Virginia bar exam in September of 1855. But when war clouds started coming over Virginia's state, Mosby supported the Union. And he believed in the Union. And his friends really believed that John Singleton Mosby would join the Union Army because he loved this country. But just like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, he could not pull his sword against his mother's state, and he joined the Washington Mounted Rifles that would later become the 1st Virginia Cavalry. And the rest was history for this man. Due to the passing of the Confederate Partisan Ranger Act on the April the 21st of 1862, the Confederate government authorized the creation of partisan units or guerrilla units. And as soon as John Singleton Mosby heard about this Partisan Ranger Act, he wanted to form his unit. And he started going to Jeb Stewart and he started bothering him. I would like to try this. I think I could be successful. And finally, Jeb Stewart relented, and he gave him nine men. And Mosby started his guerrilla operations in northern Virginia in early January of 1863. Stewart would give Mosby nine men. Then he would give him 15 men. And when the war ended, almost 2,000 men had rowed with John Singleton Mosby during that two and a half year period. Mosby's men operated behind enemy lines for about two and a half years, and of course, they came into Prince William County. And I'm going to talk about one of those raids later tonight. Mosby or Mosby's Rangers, were probably the most famous and renowned Confederate guerrilla unit that served during that entire four-year period. Mosby disbanded his unit rather than surrender to the Union authorities, which even enhanced his legacy. He never surrendered. The U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps, and I want to point out, I was a director of an Army organization for 19 years, and I served 37 years working for the Department of the Army. I'm a Vietnam-era veteran, and I am proud of my service. The U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps still study the tactics of the 43rd Battalion of Virginia Cavalry in today's military. Why? Because what we're fighting or what we fought in Iraq and Afghanistan was guerrilla warfare. And guerrilla tactics are still relevant today and our military still study John Singleton Mosby. And I was not going to leave here today until I said that to everyone in this room. I personally have led three Army staff rides into Mosby's Confederacy for our future leaders of the U.S. Army. And I'm sure that they will ask me again. Mosby died in late May of 1916 at 82 years of age and is buried in Warrington Cemetery. And I'm sure there's people here that have gone on tours with me and I've taken them to his grave. He outlived a large number of Union and Confederate commanders when he died. 
At this time, I'm going to start talking about some of the incidents that occurred in Prince William County. I'm going to warn some of you that they're kind of brutal some, and some are not. But these incidents and these events occurred, and I want to tell you about them. I hope that you will find them interesting. I've got war clouds surrounding Effingham. It's a winery today. But people lived there 150, 160 years ago. There were two Howison brothers who lived in Prince William County, and they both were lawyers and later became judges. Alan Howison lived at Effingham, and he had two daughters by the name of Mary and Harriet. Harriet was known as Hattie. Hattie was considered the prettier of the two. Jim Howison lived at a place called Epson. It's no longer there today. He had a family, and he had a daughter named Emma. And Emma was considered one of the most beautiful women in Prince William County. And some people in Prince William County said she might have been the most beautiful woman in the entire state of Virginia. When you have beautiful young ladies, what are you going to have later? A bunch of men, A bunch of men young men. They're going to want to meet these women. On the 20th of December of 1862, Wade Hampton's cavalry camped outside of Effingham. They had about 30 wagons. They had about 50 Union prisoners. They had cavalrymen. And they also had members of the Iron Scouts. And I believe that might have been the first time that some of the members of the Iron Scouts met Miss Emma and Miss Hattie and baby Mary too. But that's not the reason why I came here tonight. I came here for a different story. You gotta calm me down, I get a little loud. <laughs> On January the 1st of 1864, New Year's Day, a lot of people were celebrating the new year here in Prince William County. There were two Iron Scouts, one by the name of Barney Hennigan and the other one by the name of Sergeant E. Prelo Henderson. They were both from South Carolina. And they're now visiting a lot of the houses in the area because on New Year's Day, there's a day of hope in Virginia. And people are hoping for a better day. They're hoping for the war to end. And these men are bouncing from house to house and they're getting alcohol and they're getting food and they're having a good time. But Charlie Hennigan, he really liked Miss Emma and she's staying with her father at Jim Howison's house, Epson. And Alan Howison and his family is also there to bring in the new year. The two Iron Scouts ride up to the house, but they don't go up to the house. They go into the woods and they tie their horses inside the forest. Now, why did they do that? Does anybody want to guess? Why, did they, why didn't they just ride up to the house? What? They're still fighting the war. And they're There's a war going on. There's Union patrols going all throughout the area. There's Union camps everywhere. They can't ride up to that house and tie their horses and go inside. They've got to hide the horses in the woods. we got a smart group here. <laughs> then they walk over to the house and they knock on the door. The Howison family opens the door. They know them. 
they invite him down into the basement. And that's where a lot of Virginians would eat their food and entertain. And those two iron scouts are getting to talk to Emma and to Hattie and to the parents, and they're having a very good time. Then all of a sudden, the door opens and two well-dressed Union cavalrymen come in because they came there to see the Howison girls. <laughs> and much to their surprise, they see revolvers pointing directly at them. And those two iron scouts would disarm those two men. And they would take them up the stairs and they would take them outside and they would grab those horses and they start heading back to the woods where they had hid their horses. But behind them is Jim Howison. And Jim Howison has a very serious, stoic, stern look on his face. And when they get to the site where they had hidden their own horses, they tie up the two Union men, and Jim Howison walks up to the two Iron Scouts, and he says, you've got to do me a favor. You've got to promise me something. Are you men of your word? And they both say, yeah, we're, we're men of our word. And he goes on to say, do you know about the proclamation that was issued by the Union authorities? And that proclamation said that if there was any Union soldiers that were threatened, captured, or killed near a residence, that residence would be burned down. Jim Howison had a family, and he said, you've got to kill those two Yankees. You've got to do this favor for me. We can't let them live. You've got to kill them. You've got to promise me you're going to kill them. He says, have I always been good to you two? Have I always given you food? Have I always given you feed for your horses? And they both reluctantly looked at Mr. Howison and they said, yes. He said, tomorrow, I want you to spend the night here in the woods. I'll come back tomorrow morning and I'll have food for everyone. But are you men of your word? And those two Iron Scouts said yes. And Mr. Howison went back to his house. At sunrise the next morning, Jim Howison returned to the woods. And true to his word, he had food for the two Iron Scouts and food for the Union prisoners. Those Union prisoners heard what he had said the day before. And now he's saying, are you going to keep your word? Are you men of your word? And the two men again reluctantly said, we gave you, we promised you. We will, we will take care of them. And those Union soldiers are hearing this, that they're going to be murdered. I don't know what other, other word to use. When it got dark, the two Iron Scouts mount up, they get the two prisoners, and they hit off down the Bristow Station Road, heading towards Falkier County. They go by Catlett Station. They go by Mr. Hickson's house, who was a Union sympathizer. There were still people believed in the Union that lived here in Virginia. That's what makes us a great state. I think a great country. And they go in too deep into the woods, these two Iron Scouts and these two Union prisoners, and they finally get to a place which they believe is going to be the execution site. Charlie Hennigan dismounts, Henderson dismounts, the two Union prisoners dismount, and Charlie Hennigan says, get down on your knees and start praying. And these men started pleading for their lives. They were not in a mood to pray. 
They were pleading for their life. They said, we'll do anything, just do not do this. We'll never say where we were captured. Please don't do this. Both of these Iron Scouts had been involved in combat. And they had killed many a Union soldier that had fired upon them. But they had never committed such a cowardly act as to murder two unarmed men. But they had promised Jim Howison. And they thought they had to follow through with this. And these two men were pleading for their lives, saying, we'll never tell anybody. We won't let anybody know. And finally, Charlie Hennigan, who should have been a backwoods lawyer, he starts cursing at him and screaming at him and says, if you promise you won't say where we're from, we'll turn you over to the Confederate authorities. And they said, we'll never say a word. And that's what they did. They took these two Union prisoners that they had given a promise to Jim Howison, and they turned him over to the Confederate Provost Marshal, and they were put in a prisoner of war camp. Jim Howison's house was never burned down. And Jim Howison believed, probably to his grave, that those two Iron Scouts had killed those two Union troopers. I wanted to find out a little bit more about Jim Howison. And I found out that he died on May 19th of 1874. His obituary stated that he was nearly 70 years of age. He was a Christian gentleman He was exemplified in life as a kind neighbor, a tender and devoted husband, and an affectionate and indulgent father. But James Howison wanted those two men murdered to protect his family and to protect his home. I don't know if I would have been the same way considering the circumstances, but that story touched me. And I wanted to make sure that that story was in my book and I wanted to tell that story tonight. There is a family cemetery right next to Effingham. It's not on the grounds. It's on the other side of a fence. It's a hill. I've been up there many times, sometimes legally. (laughs) James Harrison is buried there, or James Howison. Alan Howison and their wives and their family. They're almost buried side by side, the two brothers. Also buried at the Effingham Cemetery is a man who served in the Chicopin Rangers and later served in Mosby's Rangers. And his name is James Monroe Barbie. And I was fortunate enough to find a picture of him when we took a picture of his stone. Whether you want to recognize people who served in the Confederacy or not, I'm always searching for the graves of Union and Confederate soldiers. I think it's very important to me. I don't know how you feel, but it is extremely important to me. When we were researching our book and we were looking up information on the Chickapin Rangers, there was an individual who was a descendant of the Kinchlow family. And he was able to provide us with a wealth of information on the Chicopin Rangers. 
And he found this document about this incident that was passed down from generation to generation. And it was such a neat story, a brutal story. But I wanted that to go in the book, and I'm going to tell you that story whether you like it or not tonight. At an unknown place and at an unknown date, although it is very plausible, it occurred here in Prince William County, Captain James Cornelius Kinchlow, and look at his face. Does he look like a hardened man? He's in a field by himself on his horse. And he is attacked by three Union cavalrymen. And they have sabers. And they are trying to slash him. And he pulls his slave, saber. And he is swinging it over his head. And by his body, warding off the blows of those three Union soldiers. Or troopers. And right when it looks like he's going to be overpowered... Here comes two Confederates on their horses racing across the field. And one of the men is Captain Frank Stringfellow, a famous scout and a famous spy. And the other man was a member of the Chicopin Rangers who served under James Cornelius Kinchlow. And his name was Private or Corporal, I'm sorry, Corporal Lewis Woodyard. I don't have a picture of him, but I do have a picture of his tombstone. He's buried right on the border of Fairfax County near the Bull Run Marina. Lewis Woody had rides up to that first Union soldier and he pulls out his revolver and he shoots him point blank in the face, killing him instantly, falling off of his horse. And he says, doggone you. Take that, because the blood was hot. Frank Stringfellow had expended every bullet in his revolver, and he rides up to his man, and he pulls out his revolver, and he hits the second Union trooper upside the head, knocking him from his saddle. And now James Cornelius Kinchlow is one-on-one -on -one with that last Union cavalryman, and he has his saber, and he makes a thunderous blow and he call of that third Union trooper, killing him. I'm not saying this is something to brag about. I'm saying that war is hell. And it's about killing people. And it's about doing horrible things. So don't think... I'm up here to romanticize what happened during that war. It was a short story, but I made sure that it got into our book. There was an incident that I want to talk about that occurred on the 6th of November of 1863. But before I start talking about November 6 of 63, I've got to talk about something that happened on the 18th of October of 63. The gentleman that you see off to the, I guess it would be your left, is a Mosby Ranger, but he actually served, was serving in the 7th Virginia Cavalry, and his name was William or Billy Brent. He was from Fauquier County. And he's serving in the 7th Virginia Cavalry, and he's at a place called Kettle Run here in Prince William County, and they're engaged a, unit, a, a Union Army unit or cavalry unit, and there's hand-to-hand -hand fighting going on, and a Union trooper rides up to Billy Brent, pulls out his revolver, and puts a hole in his chest, knocking him from his horse. Brutally injured. I'm surprised he didn't die. He did not die. When the fighting is over, the men from his unit would take him to a place called Ariel Marsteller's house. The Marsteller's house was located at the corner of Route 28 and Aden Road. And he would stay there 
for about two or three weeks recovering from this very severe injury. Like I said, he's lucky he didn't die, especially in 1863. But because he was from Falkier County, Billy Britt had a lot of friends from Falkier and from Prince William County, and they're coming to the Marsteller place to see how he's doing. And one of the people that comes to his house is his father. On the 6th of November of 1863, Billy Brent's father goes to the Marsteller place to check on his son. And he's able to see that his son is recovering. And the Marstellers are about to have dinner when a union adjutant rides up to the house looking for food, dismounts, knocks on the door, and says, do you have any food for me? Now, what do you think the Marsteller family said? What do you think they said to him? Come on in. Come on in. We have food for you. And this Union officer is sitting at the table with a Confederate soldier who is recovering from a very severe room, wound, his father, and several me members of the Marsteller family. And believe it or not, it must have been a very congenial dinner. And when it was done, this Union adjutant gets up from the table, thanks everybody for the food, walks outside, mounts his horse, and leaves. He must not have thought that Billy Brent was worth taking, probably thinking he was too severely wounded to even mess with him. Humanity. I wanted to talk about humanity. But that poor soul rides back to his camp and he runs into Charlie Hall. And he also runs into a guy by the name of Nick Carter. And he is ambushed and he is captured. Charlie Hall would ride with Mosby's Rangers and Nick Carter was more like a killer and a murderer. And he had gone on a couple raids with Mosby and they have captured these men. They are known as very notorious, dangerous men and they are called brevet outlaws. And they had never taken a prisoner back to the Confederate authorities. And they have captured this Union adjutant. And he tells them that he had just came from the Marsteller place. And they knew Billy Brent. And they were on their way to see Billy Brent when they captured this Union officer. So they go back to the Marsteller place and they go inside and they're, they're seeing that, that Billy Brent's doing okay, but they still have that Union officer as a prisoner. And one of them, it's not clear which one, says to Mr. Brent, the father, we suggest you take your son out of here tonight. Because in a few hours, there's going to be Union patrols looking for this Union officer. And Mr. Brent, the father, wraps his son up in his black cloak, hiding his son's Confederate uniform, puts him on a wagon, and they head off to Fauquier County, looking for a safe house for his son to recover. The story about the Union adjutant, some people say it's unclear, I'm pretty sure I know the fate, especially knowing who these two men are, or not Brent, but Charlie Hall and Nick Carter. And I can firmly say to everyone in this room that the fate of that unknown Union officer and adjutant, I believe his last day on earth was 6 November of 1863. I believe he was murdered by those two men. I'm not condoning it and I'm not bragging about it. I'm just telling you the story 
and saying it as seriously as I can. I'm going to reiterate again that war is horrible and it is a brutal business and it is not for the faint of heart. And I'm thinking about those people in Ukraine who are fighting for their lives. And I want you to think about the families that have been lost there. And think about the families that we lost in the North and the South during that four-year period. I like to tell people that over 620,000 Americans died during that four-year war. Now, a lot of historians have looked at the census records and they believe that it could be as high as 750 to 850,000, and I'm going to use the term Americans, that died during that four-year conflict. You could add up all the number of men that died during the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, Vietnam, Desert Storm, OIF or OEF, Afghanistan and Iraq, and you still would not come up with 620,000 Americans. If you leave here thinking about one thing, remember that. The house that you see is called Hazelwood. The gentleman that you see is Private John Calhoun <laughs> Colvin. The Colvin family lived in Hazelwood. And they had two sons that joined the Confederate Army to defend Virginia, and they were both killed. And their parents had a son who was 16 years old. And the Iron Scouts are operating in Prince William County in June or July of 1864, and they become friends with young Colvin. And they must have liked him, and he must have proved his mettle. Maybe he took him a shortcut to get from one place to another, but they convinced that 16-year-old kid to join the Iron Scouts, which was a unit from South Carolina. This young boy probably thought they would never leave Prince William. And probably shortly after he joined, they went outside of Richmond. And then in January of 1865, Robert E. Lee ordered Wade Hampton and his South Carolinians to return to South Carolina. And this young boy, who was from Prince William County, who had joined the Iron Scouts, was now going to South Carolina, leaving the state that he really wanted to fight for. Think about that. He didn't want to fight in South Carolina. Whether you agree with what he did or not. But when that war ended, he had captured a Union horse that had a U.S. brand on it. And a lot of the South Carolinian soldiers were signing their parole and they were going home. But this 16-year-old did not want to give up that Union horse. And he decided he was not going to sign his parole. He decided he was going to try to make his way back to the great state of Virginia, because that's what he considered it. He cannot travel during the day. So he's sleeping during the day, and he's traveling through the woods and, and past because he can't go on the road. Because if he gets captured with a Union horse with a U.S. brand on it, he's either going to be hanged or he's going to be shot immediately. So he is being very careful on his trek, which is somewhere around seven to 800 miles away. In May 
1865, he crosses into Virginia. And now he's making his way to Prince William County. On the 25th of May, he's on his horse. He's coming up this long driveway of Hazelwood. And he can actually see his mother and his father in the garden, working in the garden. I want you all to know that they didn't think they lost two sons. They thought they had lost three sons because they had not heard from him. So here he is riding up the driveway. He is dirty. He is filthy. He is scraggly. And he has lost a lot of weight. And his own mother and father do not even recognize him. He finally rides up and he smiles. And his mother realizes that's her youngest boy. The one they thought had died at the end. And she races over to that boy and she hugs him with joy and tears are coming down her face because he had lived. He had returned home. It must have been a great feeling for the mother and the father to realize that they thought they had lost three sons, but at least one came back. He went on to become an outstanding citizen here in Prince William County. He got involved in politics. And when he went to the reunions, he didn't go to the reunions here in Virginia. He would have to make his way to South Carolina because he had served in the Iron Scouts in a South Carolina unit. And he was even well known when he was 16 years old as a scout by Wade Hampton. And every time he would show up at these reunions in South Carolina, Wade Hampton would walk up to him and say, there's my boy scout. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting story. It's a human interest side. Sometimes it isn't about killing everybody. But that story was so good that Chuck and I, we had to find a picture of Colvin, and we had to go to, to, uh, to Hazelwood and take pictures of that house. That house is still there, but it's, it's in a terrible condition. I took a a busload of about 50 people there about two or three years ago, and it was a, an experience. And I love telling that story. If, if you haven't figured it out, I love telling stories. But real stories. Is the house occupied? No. It's in very bad condition, but it's still there. Where's the uh, it's, it's off of, I believe, Aiden Road. And there's a gate sometimes that stops you from getting there. What'd you say? Is that near Aiden Road or Route 28? Uh, it's not near Route 28, but it is on Aiden Road. Is Colvin of the Colvin family where Colvin Lane is in Noakesville? Well, it's not too far from Noakesville, so it could be. Definitely could be. John, yes. Excuse me? You, you did? Well, that's pretty neat. I like that. That's cool. You never know who you're going to run into in these events. I, I, I've got some stories that I could tell you about how I ran into certain people that did certain things. It's, it's really amazing. I've got another story I want to tell you. I know I'm probably boring you to death, but this happened on April the 2nd of 1863. There was a cor corporal, Huger Meichler. He was the brother of Sergeant Bill Meichler. And he's been ordered to take two men, one by the name of George Crafton and the other one by the name of James K. Pearson, and to head down towards Woodbridge and Dale City and find out what's going on down there and report back to his brother. And they're on Delaney Road, which is where 
the Greenwood Presbyterian Church used to be, there still is a cemetery there. But Union Cavalry are at that church. And they have set up an ambush site. And Hugo Meichler and his two other men are going down that road when all of a sudden those Union soldiers start shooting their revolvers and their rifles at the men. And Hugo Meichler is killed instantly. George Crafton would take several bullets in his coat, but is not hit. James Pearson would take several bullets in his coat and two bullet holes were found in his hat. But neither one of those two men was hit and neither one of their horses was hit. And George Crafton had to go back and tell Billy Meichler that his brother, which was his older brother, was killed in an ambush at the Greenwood Presbyterian Church. Those Union soldiers had some compassion. They took Huger Meichler's body, they took him up to the cemetery, they contacted the local citizens in the Dale City area and said, if you want to bury him, you can. And over 150 some years later, Huger Meichler from South Carolina has been living in an unmarked grave in that church cemetery. And there is no marker for his grave. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, he was a Confederate soldier. Confederate soldiers were American soldiers. And I know that we have some very important people in this room. And I want to urge you that we need to get a VA marker and it needs to be placed in that cemetery so that man will not be forgotten. Also in that cemetery is a Union soldier who is in one of the District of Columbia units, and he has a very nice stone. And I hope that I will live long enough to attend a ceremony to honor Huger Michler. I hope there's somebody in this room listening to me. I want you to listen to me. Sounds like I'm preaching. <laughs> the last incident I want to talk about occurred on May 17th of 1863. John Singleton Mosby and about 25 rangers come from Fauquier County, and he's heard that there's a large supply wagon train in Dumfries. And the Confederacy and Mosby's rangers need supplies. And Mosby has decided he's going to go all the way to Dumfries. He's going to come down 234, which is Dumfries Road. And he's going to go into Dumfries and he's going to attack that supply wagon. And he's going to grab those supplies and he's going to bring them back to Falkir County. Sounds like a pretty good plan, doesn't it? What happens to good plans? They, go awry. they fall apart. Mosby makes his way all the way down to Dumfries. He sees that supply wagon train but it is so heavily guarded by Union infantry that even Mosby says, I'm not going to take that on. So he turns around and he rides back up the Dumfries Road towards Minneville Road. And he goes down Minneville Road a short distance and there's a farm, Moses Lynn's farm. And Mosby's men have been in the saddle for a long time and he says, all right, Let's, let's, let's take a rest. And a lot of those troopers in Mosby's command jump off of their horses and they take the bridles off their horses and the saddles. And some of the men are already asleep, getting the rest that they really needed. Mosby always kept his horse saddled. But Mosby was smart enough to know to put some vedettes, and vedettes are mounted guards for you that don't know. 
to put some vedettes out on the Dumfries Road to keep an eye out on for what? Union, Union Cavalry. And there's a lot of people sleeping and resting, but all of a sudden, a, a scream is heard. The Yankees are coming, the Yankees are coming, and Mosby jumps up, and he tells his man to get ready, and people are putting on the bridles of their horses, and they're putting on their saddles, and they're jumping on their horses, and man, Mosby is saying, let's get ready to fight. But there's a gate that's closed. The gate is separating Mosby's men from the 16th Pennsylvania Cavalry, commanded by a young lieutenant by the name of Alva Young. And finally, one of Mosby's men opens that gate, and they race through that gate, and they engage the 16th Pennsylvania in hand-to-hand -hand fighting right in the middle of the Dumfries Road. But Mosby had an advantage, even though he was surprised. His men have Colt 44s, and they are firing those Colt 44s indiscriminately. The troopers from the 16th Pennsylvania, they have sabers. A big disadvantage. And Mosby and his men who were surprised in that engagement there on the Dumfries Road win the day with a large number of the Union troopers running in every direction to get away from that murderous fire of those Colt 44s. In that small little engagement, Mosby would kill one man of the 16th Pennsylvania. He would mortally wound another. Alva Young, the young lieutenant, would be shot in the shoulder. And he would be the only one recognized on the Union side for gallantry because he kept trying to rally his men. But his service was over after that fight there near Moses Lynn's house. By Mosby taking the initiative instead of running and charging and attacking, Mosby would not lose one man wounded and not one man killed. And he would capture four Union soldiers in that fight. Mosby would do these top of types of operations over and over and over again. And he would win over 95 or 96 or 97 percent of the engagements that he was involved in for that two and a half year period. And I wanted to talk about Mosby's fight in the Dale City area. Mosby was a fighter, and he would become successful because of that. I want to end my presentation tonight. I started out by talking about my third and fourth grade teacher. I want to end my presentation talking about my second grade teacher. And her name was Mrs. Dickerson. And on the first day of school, in the second grade, Mrs. Dickerson said to me and my entire class, you are all Virginians. And you are all destined to do something great. I don't think the teachers say that to students anymore. Whether Virginians or North Carolinians or Massachusetts or just your great Americans and you're destined to do something great. But I can tell you right now, I still remember that statement like it was yesterday. That concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. God bless America.